Are you ready to revolutionize your relationship with money? Welcome to the Finding Financial Freedom podcast with The Frugal Physician, where I, Dr. Disha Spath, will be your companion on this exciting adventure. Get ready to conquer debt, build wealth, and embrace a mindful spending lifestyle that will empower you to live life on your own terms. Pearson Ravitz's story begins with Dr. Stephanie Pearson, a passionate ob at the height of her career. But then, a shoulder injury struck during a precipitous delivery. Her dreams were shattered, leaving her unable to practice medicine. Determined to make a difference, Stephanie became an advocate for her peers, guiding them through the complex disability process. Alongside insurance expert Scott Ravitz, Stephanie founded Pearson Ravitz, a company determined to approach insurance differently. Together, they set their mission to educate and empower physicians to protect their most valuable asset, their income, and the most important people in their life, their family. Today, Pearson Ravitz serves the medical community in all 50 states. At Pearson Ravitz, they understand the unique concerns of physicians. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Ravitz builds human connections before they create quotes. Life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness or injury could leave you and your family in a devastating financial situation. But with a little planning and guidance, you can prepare for every possibility. Visit PearsonRavitz.com to schedule your consultation with a Pearson Ravitz advisor. Welcome to Finding Financial Freedom with The Frugal Physician. I'm your host, Dr. Disha Spath. Today, we have an incredible guest who's a true expert when it comes to achieving financial independence. Grant Sabatier is the author of the international bestseller, Financial Freedom, the creator of the Financial Freedom course, an instructor at LinkedIn Learning, and the mastermind behind Millennial Money. He's also the co-founder of Topia and serves as the CEO of Bank Bonus. With a passion for money, mindfulness, and financial independence, his story and ideas have been featured in prestigious publications such as The New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, CNBC, and Business Insider. I'm thrilled to welcome Grant Sabatier to the show. Grant, thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here. I'm so glad to have you on. I've been a big fan of yours and have been following your work. I'm so glad to introduce my audience to you. I'd love to start by asking about your journey to financial independence and what led you to write the book, Financial Freedom. Yeah, so my story starts back when I was born. My parents lived in southern Indiana in a one stoplight town, and their families both had lived there for a long time. And when I was six months old, they made the decision to leave southern Indiana and move to the suburbs of Washington, D.C. So I could, quote unquote, you know, get a better opportunity. And so growing up, you know, my parents were always stressed about money. It was something that they fought about. It was something that was very present in our household. They moved from a place without a lot of money started you know, new careers from scratch. My mom worked as a secretary and my dad cleaned the office building where my mother worked in DC. And you know, there's a fair amount of money in DC. And so growing up, you know, I was the kid that you know, didn't have as much as everyone else. And that was something that I really recognized. And I'm an only child. And so you know, deep in this story, my parents were always telling me how they were doing and making these sacrifices so I could get a different opportunity. So it really embedded a lot of, I think, stress in my life, especially around money. You know, I worked really hard. I did everything that I thought I was supposed to do. I graduated number two in my class. I ended up going to the University of Chicago, you know, a really great university, studying philosophy. And this entire time, you know, in my early 20s, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I thought maybe I want to be a writer. You know, maybe I want to get into consulting. Maybe I want to be a doctor. I thought I'd be pre-med for a little while. And just, you know, I couldn't really find what I wanted to do. And I felt like there was something wrong with me because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I graduated and bounced around you know, four different jobs. This is in 2007 to 2010. I got laid off twice. And at the age of 24, I had to move back home with my parents, these parents who had given me everything that they could to help me succeed. And moving back home in June of 2010 was you know, a really low point in my life. I had $2.26 in my bank account. You know, obviously, I couldn't afford rent. And I was really kind of starting from scratch when it came to money. And they invited me to a July 4th picnic that I went to, and I was the only adult child there of all their friends. And the only thing that anyone could talk about, you know, these are people in their late fifties, early sixties was retirement. It's every single conversation there day. When are you going to retire? You know, what are you going to do when you retire? And it really struck me. And I saw, you know, the next, you know, 30, 40 years of my life kind of 
mapped out in front of me. And it was very, very stark. It was one of those aha moments where I was like, geez, you know, I don't want to be this. I don't want to be, you know, in my early sixties, then starting to live my life. And it was the first time that I realized my parents, you know, looked a little bit older. And I recognized that a lot of the dreams they had talked about when I was growing up, not only had they not accomplished them, but they didn't even have them anymore. And so, you know, I'm processing all of this. And, you know, I started thinking about money and I was like, you know, I'm a smart guy. I'm a philosophy major. You know, I haven't really thought about money beyond just wanting to, to make enough to survive. What is money really? And I started, you know, diving into money as a concept, you know, as a form of energy. I was like, I'm going to figure this whole thing out. So I Googled best money books and your money or your life by Vicky Robin and Joe Dominguez was the first book that came up. So I ordered it. This is August, 2010. I got it. You know, I read it all pretty much in one day and it completely transformed my vision, my entire life really. And the simple idea that whenever you're working, you're trading your life energy for money. It's very funny because my takeaway from that was, okay, if I'm going to trade my life energy for money, I need to figure out how to make as much money as quickly as possible, which is actually something that, you know, Vicky Robin, who's one of my mentors and now a really dear friend, that wasn't her intention in writing the book at all. So I took something, you know, away from it. It was very different. But then I started going down the rabbit hole of looking, you know, how to make money fast, how to make money quickly. And I realized, wow, you know, most of the money world seems like a scam. But, you know, what's real here? What's going on? I started reading, you know, other personal finance books, you know, the Susie Hormans and the Dave Ramsey's and the David Box. And you know, I recognized like, geez, you know, all this advice is, you know, help people retire when they're 65. And I don't want to wait that long. You know, can I do this a little bit earlier? And so I ended up figuring out, you know, that Google ads, you know, was a growing industry and I didn't have any experience at all, but then I could get certified by Google for free by taking a test. So I spent the next 30 days from August to September of 2010 studying, you know, Google AdWords and I ended up getting the free certification from Google. I applied to a digital marketing agency in Chicago, which is where my girlfriend lived, I ended up getting the first job that I applied to, worked at that digital agency for a year. During that time, I was saving 50% of my income. My salary was $52,000, but I started side hustling and building websites on the side and really got a PhD in digital marketing during that first year. And by the end of that first year, I'd made over $200,000 on the side in addition to my $52,000 full-time job. And I'd saved almost 100% of that side income and you know lived in an $800 a month apartment, drove a $700 car. And I was really sold on the idea of trying to save the highest percentage of my income that I could so that I could increase the chance that that money could grow and compound. And I was really off to the races and it took me five years, three months and two days from leaving my parents' house to reach financial independence. So to go from $2.26 in my bank account to 1.25 million and I just turned 30. It was a pretty hectic period, but you know, like anything in life, you know, I spent all of my time thinking about money reading about money, learning about money, making money. And I feel like I learned an immense amount about it during that time period. And once I got there, my parents were still working. All my friends were still stressed about money. I was like, geez, I've learned so much. I want to share what I've learned. And so I launched millennialmoney.com, which was my blog and started being extremely open and vulnerable about what I'd gone through, what I'd accomplished, what I'd learned, the mistakes I'd made, and then started sharing that with my friends. And really the blog just took off and became a stratospheric success beyond my wild imagination and led to the book deal with Penguin and appearances on NPR and Nightline and on the Rachel Ray show. And yeah, it's just been pretty surreal to look back on and see how, you know, all those pieces fit together and, you know, have led me to today. Wow. What a story. There's so much to dig into there. I think an important concept that you brought up there was that trading time for money ties up your energy to that money. And once you start learning about money and investing, you realize that that money has a life of its own and can actually earn you money. And somehow your energy then gets dissociated with the money that you have and that money starts making its own money. And that's a really important and powerful concept that opens people's minds up, right? When you were at this picnic and you realized that the traditional life was not exactly what you wanted, and you started opening your mind up, you started challenging traditional retirement, basically. Can you tell me some of the vital choices that you made that got you then to move towards learning a new skill on Google marketing and then changing your outlook on the way you would be working? You know, something very powerful in life when you have nothing to lose. 
It's actually a really empowering position. I think a lot of people view when they're in a lot of debt, when they feel stuck, it can feel really overwhelming and really claustrophobic. I think for me, it felt that way initially. And then it started to feel somewhat freeing, right? Because I didn't have anything to lose. And so I could take some bigger risks. I could try new things, you know, and I think especially people now, you know, all the readers that I chat with, you know, even people making, you know, like physicians, six figures a year, 200,000, $500,000 a year, and they still feel stuck and overwhelmed. There's something very freeing about just saving up a year or two of expenses in order to have some breathing room with which you can then take some other risks in your life or try some things out. So I think for me, it was really starting from nothing was like, hey, what can I try? What can I do differently? I knew what I was doing wasn't working. And I felt really flawed because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So once I let go of that and I saw an opportunity to make money, it was a means to an end. You know, I actually don't really like digital marketing at all. And I definitely didn't like running Google ad campaigns, but I saw it was a growing industry. I saw there was demand for it. I saw that I could learn it quickly. It appealed to my analytical nature. That's when I looked at. And so I think a lot of people, especially with their first jobs, they're told to figure out what they're passionate about, or they follow an existing blueprint just because, you know, their parents encourage them to, or other people do. And I think a lot of physicians, you know, often do this. And then at least for me, it was like, oh, this is where the money is, or I think this is where the money is. And so I'm going to go there. So it wasn't that dissimilar from someone say, you know, choosing maybe to get into finance when they're not really into finance. That's why I did it. And going in and not really loving what you do is also quite freeing if you have an end goal in mind, right? So I went in not being like, oh, I'm going to run Google ad campaigns or build websites forever. I was like, this is where the opportunity is. This is how I can make the most money, you know, as quickly as possible from my computer, hopefully from anywhere, not just, you know, sitting in an office in River North in Chicago. It had all those attributes to me and that helped me dive into it. But I think the same thing is true today. You know, when you think about, you know, all the passive income opportunities and ways to make money online, the opportunities today are 20 fold what they were when I was you know, starting my career online in 2010. So there's even more ways that you can do this. And it's cool to see more and more people trying those things out. So for me, it was really that. And then the simple idea that a Google certification, right? This is Google. This is, I've passed this test and I've proven that I can do this thing was also super empowering to me. You know, I didn't need to go back to school and take out debt or get another degree. I didn't need to, you know, apprentice for two years to figure something out. The great thing about the internet is you can learn things, you know, if you're curious so rapidly, that was the perfect storm for me. And then the last thing was really the hardest thing about my entire journey, which really started back then when I started was just choosing to live my life very differently. So that felt a little weird at first. It was like, oh, okay, I know I don't want that. What's this other thing? And so I'd read your money or your life, but I wasn't looking at blogs and there weren't you know, many people talking about this, you know, at that time. And it wasn't until I was on this path for, you know, a little over two years that I found, you know, the mad scientist blog, Brandon's blog. And once I stumbled on it, I was like, oh my gosh, he's like a year or two ahead of me. And so I soaked up as much information as I could. And then I reached out to him and I had extremely detailed, nuanced questions for him, a lot around text things. And then he wrote me back, plugged those gaps in my knowledge and you know, I felt very, very alone in the journey until I discovered him. And then, you know, I started uncovering other people who were also on the path. And then once you find other people who are living the way that you live or that you want to live, that's when it gets really, really fun because you can accelerate your learning and your progress and, you know, hang out with people who think the way that you think. And I think the internet obviously opens that up to you when, you know, your friends and your family and probably your local community you know, people like couldn't even imagine that, you know, living that way or having that mindset. Yeah, that's why I love the FIRE community, because there's so many people out there doing it and then sharing it and available to talk to and so willing and open to give you advice. Tell me a little bit about what your ideal future looked like to you, what you were working towards. I was working towards a monetary goal. So it's funny now because in my book, once I reached financial independence, it became very clear 
the things that I should have been doing that I wasn't doing. And one of those things was thinking about what do I want my life to look like? You know, why am I doing this? What I wanted was to save a million dollars, retire as quickly as possible, and just have some freedom in my life. It was really that simple. So I, I didn't think about where I wanted to live or, you know, what I wanted my lifestyle to look like. Obviously, when I wrote the book, like I naively thought that I could live on, you know, 50 or $60,000 a year forever. Now I've spent, you know, four or five times that, but I have a lot more money than I ever thought I would have for a lot of reasons. And so it's nice when you're sort of starting very frugally and very modestly and you intentionally grow into your life and your lifestyle as opposed to just trying to live up to a certain lifestyle. So that was a really fun thing. And I drove that, you know, $700 car, which I saved a million dollars. And then I bought a Lexus SUV, you know, that I still drive today, right? It was like, it was one of these things where it was like, oh crap, now I've got quite a bit of money. I can buy a few of the things that I think will give me a lot of joy. You know, I was able to do that, but I hadn't thought very hard about what I wanted my ideal life to look like. And the irony of all of this is it took me until I was already financially independent and I started writing about money to realize that that was my purpose. And that was what I was meant to do. And it took me a long time to find that thing. But, you know, I really fell in love with personal finance and investing and obviously all of these topics as I was pursuing financial independence and then sharing them with others and writing, you know, took on a whole other level of joy and added purpose and meaning and a mission to my life. And I think kind of when you have a passion and a purpose and a mission and you're doing something creative that makes you feel alive, you know, all those things are a really nice you know, recipe or equation for happiness. One of those things, you know, let alone all of them. But yeah, I feel very fortunate that I ended up here. You bring up a very good point. So initially you worked a job, not because you were in love with it, but just because it would make you money because it was a means to an end and you were working towards something. I think we put too much pressure on ourselves to find our the one job in high school and commit to it through college and grad school. And then oftentimes we get disappointed when we finally get to the end line because, you know, we put too much pressure on ourselves to try to find the purpose of our lives so early on when we don't even know who we are yet. I think taking the pressure off and just working a job because it brings you money, because you have the skills for it. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Because you have the aptitude. You don't have to love it. it of course, it's the best when all of those things line, when you love it, it makes you money, you enjoy doing it, and it gives you purpose, right? And you would do it even if you were financially independent like you are now. Just getting started and taking a step towards building that financial cushion to give you the opportunity to do it and find the one later on in life is totally okay. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people, you know, I've had the opportunity to talk with, I don't know, 500 physicians or I don't know, so many doctors and lawyers, you know, follow my work and reach out to me. And almost every time, you know, they've either spent, you know, 10 years going through schooling and then getting into their chosen degree of specialty and working for a year or two. And they're almost always, you know, have large amounts of debt. They're making good money, but they feel like they have to spend it and they really feel stuck. And they think, oh gosh, I've spent all this time in my life training for this thing that now that I'm doing that thing, it's a lot different than I thought it would be. What do I do now? Right. So the typical advice is we'll try to save as much money as you can to give yourself some options so you can get out if you want to. But I often find that people who have invested so much in learning a particular thing, when they feel stuck, they almost don't trust their intuition. But when you feel stuck as you are, right, that's what you should be listening to. That's your body and your soul telling you that this isn't right. But it's so difficult when you've spent so much time becoming that thing to pivot or to create an escape plan or to give yourself other options because you almost feel flawed in some way. And there's some that I've seen take the leap. I would say it's a minority. And when you have that realization early in your career, you should pay attention to it and act on it because the worst thing is you have that realization 20 years into your career and you're in a position where you haven't saved as much as you thought and you don't have those options. And so I like to say that you should always invest in the you that you've yet to become because you don't know who that person is going to be and you want to give yourself the best chance of being that person and setting that person up because 
the reality is we all change pretty fast and a lot faster than we often realize. It's just our culture and our society is not set up or supportive of people who pivot and people who change. That's when you really get stuck. It's a mindset shift, but as soon as you can begin preparing for it, when you do hit that moment, when you no longer like your job or you want to take some time off or you want to pivot, you know, you have that option as opposed to being stuck. But yeah, I see it a lot, a lot with physicians just burn out. Yeah. And the feeling stuck, honestly, has a lot to do with the corporatization of medicine. But also there are many ways to make medicine work for doctors. Sometimes people just need to change the way they work or think outside the box, maybe go locums, maybe start their own LLC and work as a contractor. So it gives them a little bit more control over their own time. Have you ever considered what would happen if one day you couldn't do your job anymore? I'm Dr. Disha Spath, the founder of The Frugal Physician. I'm teaming up with Dr. Stephanie Pearson, CEO of Pearson Rabbits, for a must-attend webinar that addresses this critical question. Dr. Pearson's journey is a testament to the unexpected twists life can throw at us. As a former ob her personal experience with a career-ending injury led her to become a leading voice in disability insurance for physicians. Her story isn't just powerful. It's a wake-up call for all of us in the medical profession. Join us on December 11th at 7 p.m. EST as we delve into 10 key reasons physicians need disability insurance. This isn't just another webinar. It's a deep dive into why disability insurance isn't just optional, it's essential. We'll cover the basics, key terms, and help you understand what your coverage should include. More than that, we'll share insights on how to navigate potential roadblocks and highlight the critical timing of obtaining this insurance. Don't let uncertainty dictate your future. Secure your seat now and take the first step towards safeguarding your career and your family's well-being. Click the link in the description to sign up. See you there. I love how in your book, you talk about hacking your nine to five and really making it work for you. Can you tell me a little bit about that? The first thing is most employees don't realize how much leverage they actually have, right? So we tend to go into being an employee out of the fear that if we do something wrong, we're going to get fired. You know, we can only expect two to 3% raises every year. But the reality is for most physicians, you know, if you have a decent education, the demand for what you do is probably so much higher than you realize that it is. And in the book, I make the case that it costs the average employer 40 to 60% of your annual salary just to replace you when you leave. And so them giving you a 10 to 20% raise just so you'll stick around is very reasonable. I think it's important to come into, I mean, even when you're negotiating, you know, your pay package as a physician, when you're negotiating raises and flexibility, you have a lot more leverage and power than you recognize. And you need to test that out. And not only test that out, but you need to back it up with data. This is one of those areas where there's just so much information out there available to, uh, you know, employees around market compensation. You know, what is someone with your experience and skill set getting paid in other companies or in other situations? There's so many recruiters. I make the big case that you should build relationships with recruiters because recruiters, you know, job is to find you a job, but you're not the one that pays them. It's the company that's looking for someone like you. And so they're an immense resource. If you build relationships with them, they can tell you likely with much more certainty what your market value is based on your skills and experience, based on the other jobs that they're seeing in the market. They can help you find other jobs. And I just don't see a lot of people taking advantage of that. They only talk to a recruiter when they're ready to leave their job. But I encourage you to build relationships with recruiters throughout your entire career because they have access to much more data than you're going to have yourself. And they're going to be open to finding you new opportunities. And the more data that you can use when you go in to your employer to negotiate a raise or try to get paid what you're worth, the more difficult it is for your employer who likely has some of that data, but not as much 
to, you know, counter argue with you. And they're going to be like, wow, this person's really prepared. They've got data. They feel empowered. We don't want to lose them. It's a position of strength. And I think a lot of people, they're just fearful of that. And I think I talk in the book about, you know, I've had, you know, well over 50 employees that I've personally employed. And I think like three of them in that entire time period actually came in and asked for a raise, you know, that was beyond, you know, just a normal kind of one to 2% raise. And in a lot of cases, there are people who, if they would have asked for it, could have gotten really large ranges. But, you know, in the book, I talk about how most companies are really just legal pyramid schemes, right? Which is true, right? It's like someone at the top is making the money, whether it's the shareholder or the CEO or the board or everyone else. And so capitalism works on, you know, exploitation. It works on, you know, taking advantage of the workers and people who are working and trying to get as much value out of them for as little money as possible. And when you kind of just think about how the system works and try to use it to your advantage, you can often make a lot more money than you think, you know, just with that new sort of negotiation strategies. And then you get better at it over time. And then it just gives you more money to then save and it gives you more options and flexibility. It's a really just beautiful time that we live in because of so much information that's available to everyone and so many options that are available to everyone. But whether it's out of fear or sort of lack of uncertainty or just not being trained how to do it, most people tend to accept what they're offered and feel like it's good enough. And you know, I'm a huge believer in the fact that you should really try to get the most you can out of your employer because, you know, they're probably making a lot more money off of you than you even realize. Yeah, that's very true in the physician world. That's a great point that you bring up about building relationships with recruiters. Honestly, we get so many recruiting calls that it's almost a pester. And I've never really thought about making a relationship, you know, and establishing a relationship there. I have to say the job that I'm in now was brought to me by someone that was recruiting for the hospital, but I had a relationship with actually through a previous position and actually resulted in me getting kind of the position that I'm really meant for. And she knew that. And that is a very powerful thing. I love how you also talk about building relationships at work and taking a person out for lunch, you know, once in a while. Tell us a little bit about that. And how do you approach people to go out to lunch with you without, you know, seeming like a creeper? Or you, well, I would feel uncomfortable almost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm at the heart of all of this is I'm an extreme introvert. I love hiding behind my computer screen and my writing. And, you know, it's very, very difficult for me to you know make small talk and network. You know, I just don't have that talent or that skill set. You know, I knew that going into this sort of second phase of my career when I worked at the digital marketing agency. And so I had to work very hard to try to break down that barrier in myself. And I looked at it through the lens of learning. You know, how can I learn as much as possible? Yes, I'm getting paid $52,000. You know, I worked with about 30 people at this digital agency. Here's a group of people who, you know, most of them are pretty cool. People who work at digital agencies are pretty cool. They're nice. They want to go out to lunch because they want to get out of the office. They want to get coffee. They want to have a beer after work. How do I take advantage of this and just mine you know, them for information so I can accelerate my learning? Because this thing is you can learn a ton online. I've always, and I still do this, I look for filters in my life. And so there's just infinite amounts of information that if you don't have good filters, you know, whether it's following certain people on Twitter or having mentors or having people who are, you know, experienced your learning is going to be quite slow because you're going to have to try to figure out things from scratch. Whereas for me, I was like, oh, here are people that know the thing. And so I want to chat with them. I want to ask them questions. And so I really started there. These are all people that I worked with that were nice. But, you know, even the CEO, you know, at the time I was, you know, 24, 25, he was 31. And so he had a lot of success. And I was like, oh, maybe I want what he has. And he's a smart, open guy. And obviously he wants to help me because I'm working for him and the more than I can learn. And then you know, I quickly realized that the most valuable skill set in the entire agency was selling. You know, there were two new business people. You know, one of them sat right across from me. And I was like, okay, these are the guys that are probably making the most money in the agency because they're bringing in all the business. And so how can I get involved with them? And so I remember asking this guy, Dave Berg, who was the head sales guy. I said, hey, you know, we just pitched Toyota. Can I see the proposal? You know, I know there's some Google ads spending this. Can I just see the proposal? So he gave it to me. I poured over it. You know, he was interested Then I was curious and people, you know, like to help others. And so if you open yourself up to mentorship, you know, it's something about being human is that like most people want to help other people who are earlier in their journey. And so I really, really took advantage of that. 
So I started you know, reading these proposals. I sat in on a few new business pitches. And then, you know, about eight months in, I was involved in one of the largest sales that our agency you know, had made. You know, I was involved in the proposal. I sat in on the pitches. I contributed a little bit. And that was immense for me because I was like, geez, like, you know, we just sold a half a million dollar project here, you know, and I was involved. And that was instrumental to me. When I went out on my own, I used a somewhat similar proposal template. I used similar sort of billing frequencies and methods and, you know, things that I never would have known how to do myself. You know, I just copied what I learned at the agency and what was working with them. It was awesome. So, you know, start with the people that you work around or other people, especially older people uh, who are a little bit later on their career. Often, you know, maybe they feel a little stuck in their job. And so bringing some, some energy, youthful energy into their worlds and learning from them can be really fulfilling for them. And I think mentorship is something that it's not talked about a whole lot. It's kind of confusing how to find a mentor, but you can get a lot just from asking. And then for me, you know, I got a lot more comfortable, you know, asking and I try to play my advantage too, because I knew a fair amount, you know, about Google ad campaigns and I could maybe teach them something. I always tried to add, you know, value where I could as well. As an introvert, I thought more about it scientifically. It's like, here's kind of what I'm trying to execute on. I did that. But even to today, I still take a long time to get comfortable kind of in that asking people for things and, you know, to go out to lunch and, you know, something I still struggle with. Well, I think it's to your credit that you were able to put that fear aside and still put yourself out there. You know, instead of making small talk, which I think is pretty tiresome for everyone. You made it worth your while and worth their while by trying to add value to their life. And I think that is the key to relationships, really. You know, it's all give and take. So we talked a lot about your financial journey initially. I'd like to know a little bit more about some of the practical changes that you use, some practical tips for our listeners to start their journey toward financial freedom today. Yeah, I mean, the first step is really always giving clarity on where you're actually at. So I tend to find you know, even people that are making a lot of money, they're like, oh, I'm making a lot of money, but why don't I have a lot of money? And so you have to, at some point, sit down and be honest with yourself about, okay, here's what I'm spending. Here's how much debt I have. You know, just do the simple net worth calculation and realize, okay, I have to do this once. I have to figure out, you know, where I'm starting from, because if you don't know where you're starting from, you're never going to get really anywhere. So get, getting that moment of clarity, I encourage everyone, you know, to get there. And as you're doing it, don't always look through the lens of the numbers. So people often, you know, get so ah, the numbers, I'm this much in debt or that much in debt. What really helps is when you, you know, look at your expenses and you ask things like, was this worth it? How happy did this make me? Can I cut this back? Did this really add value to my life? Was the trade-off worth it? You know, I'm a huge fan of calculating your real hourly rate, which is how much money you're actually making for the amount of time that you spend in your job, but also getting ready for your job and decompressing from your job. So the reality is, you know, most people are making quite a bit less money than they think when they add up all the hours that they spend because of their job, that if they didn't have the job, they could spend differently. So we spend a lot of time shopping for clothes and, you know, grocery shopping, doing all these things to have a job that you know, a lot of people make less than they think. So calculating your real hourly wage, figuring out how much you're making, getting clarity on where you're actually at, what is your net worth, figuring out what percentage of your income you're actually saving. You know, the reality is most people, you know, say if they're in their 401ks or their 403bs, you know, for kind of a minimum one to 5% contribution rate, it's very easy to do the math and look at, oh, if I'm only saving 5% of my income, I'll probably never be able to retire. And so when you just calculate the simple math, you know, look at what the scenario looks like. And, and there's simple compound interest calculators that you can use. And, you know, I have them on my website, you know, grantsavate.com. I've built tons of different calculators that help you calculate this stuff pretty easily. If I go from saving, say, 5% of my income to 30% of my income, how much more freedom am I acquiring? And how quickly can I reach financial independence? And you start playing with some of these numbers and it's like, oh, wow. Like if I could save, you know, 25% or 30%, I could cut my time, you know, to retirement or reaching financial independence from 40 years to never to maybe down to 20 years or less. There's a lot of trade-offs that I talk about and I set up in the book where it's like, hey, if you want to spend a year of your life working for that, you know, new car and then also lose the opportunity to invest and compound that money, some of these larger purchases can really, really slow down your progress to financial independence. And so it's important to understand those trade-offs 
And then to really recognize that you can only cut back so much. And I think even still today, a lot of what's talked about in personal finance and financial advisors talk about it is, you know, just how can you cut back? How can you spend less? And that's one part of the equation. And it's it's certainly important. You don't want to be wild with your expenses. You know, you want to be you know, mindful of those. But by far, the other side of the coin, how much money you're making ends up being a much more important factor because the more money that you're making, the more that you can save and you can invest. There's a limit to how much you can cut back. So there's no limit technically on how much money you can make. And so switching from that sort of like scarcity saving mindset more to, okay, how can I make more money in all of these different myriad of ways? You know, can I start a side business? How can I be more entrepreneurial in my career? In the other time that I have, can I be launching something different? You know, how can I diversify my income streams? Can I diversify into real estate and build a real estate business, you know, where there are so many tax advantages and you don't have to go crazy. This is the thing. It's the sum is so much greater than the parts. I think in my book, there's over 800 different tips. If you do like 10 or 15 of the things, well, just those things adding up, you know, will put you far ahead of your peers and help you acquire more money than you ever thought possible. And then as you do more of them, it's important. And I always recommend, you know, rereading the book you know, once a year. And, and a lot of people do this because who you are today is going to be different than who you are next year. And the trade-offs that you're willing to make are likely going to be different. And so you have to check in with yourself with some frequency. And I generally think that most people don't spend enough time with their money. You know, we're told, oh, only check your net worth once a month or only check it once a quarter. And I'm a huge advocate for checking it every day, which is by far the biggest criticism that I get financial advisors. They're just like, Grant's dumb. He tells you to check your net worth every day, but that makes you anxious and stressed. What they don't recognize is that the more time that you spend with your money, the more comfortable that you get with it. And the easier it is to see things, the easier it is to see patterns. You know, I have my morning money meditation is what I call it, where when I'm having my coffee, I still do this today. You know, I open up my net worth tracking app. I look at, you know, my credit card charges. Was I mischarged for anything? I get pumped when my investments are growing. And I do a lot of like, Harrison over time period. So it might be like, oh gosh, you know, I mean, literally just in the last two days with the market being down, you know, my portfolio is down like $280,000, right? Which is like, oh wow, it's a ton of money. But when you actually spread out the timeline and the date range in your net worth tracking app, it's like, wow, I've come extremely far over the last two or three years. And then it's, you know, like a game. And it's like anything when you see things going up and compounding, you're like, gosh, I'd rather save and invest this money than spend it because I see how much that it's growing and I want to contribute to that growth. And so I always encourage people to spend as much time as you can with your money. Because it's like any relationship, it's going to get stronger. The more time you spend with it, you're going to be less anxious. You're going to be more empowered and you're going to see things that you didn't see before. That's a huge, huge part of my own journey and something that I recommend to others. Yeah. I mean, initially looking at the numbers is very stress inducing. It's very anxiety inducing, but using that anxiety to take action. And when you start actually making the changes, that net worth number and the progress that you're making is definitely going to improve. And then it becomes a source of strength and a source of comfort, really, in your confidence in yourself to do the right things. And it's like a positive feedback mechanism, right? And it really motivates you to continue to go forward, as long as you're keeping in mind also that, you know, of course, you're working towards your ideal future, your values, he is staying in alignment with your values while making this progress. It just makes everything so much better. You mentioned entrepreneurship. I understand you're working on a book coming out on that, hopefully in the near future. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how important entrepreneurship was to your progress? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there are a bunch of paths to financial independence, right? You can keep a nine to five job and save a certain percentage of your income. And especially if you've got a decent salary and an increasing salary, you know, you're going to get there. It might take you a little bit longer than other people, but you're still going to get there and you can accelerate your journey. The more levers that you have at your disposal, the faster you can accelerate that progress. And so how you're investing, where you're investing. And for me, the entrepreneurship piece is by far the fastest path to financial independence. And the reason why is instead of being reliant on someone else for a paycheck, you're in control of your own. You can rapidly accelerate and make choices that increase your income and then you can invest higher percentage of it. So 
I make the case in the new book that everyone is an entrepreneur, even if you don't think that you are. And it's increasingly important to be an entrepreneur amidst increasing uncertainty. I mean, you see even, you know, hospitals and medical groups and Amazon and, you know, layoffs can come at any time, even for, you know, seemingly secure jobs. And so you can't rely on any job. And so, yeah, the new book is really focused on using entrepreneurship to accelerate your journey to financial independence and all the ways that you can do that are available today that weren't available 10, 20 years ago. So just like the pursuit of financial independence or financial freedom is a shift in mindset. You know, I think a lot of entrepreneurship, a lot of people, you know, they view it as, oh, Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos, you know, or, you know, Sarah Blakely, you know, these are the prototypical entrepreneurs and we've got to grow at all cost. But the reality is, you know, entrepreneurship is a choose your own adventure and you being the creator and the founder can make choices that help you build a business around your life as opposed to your life around the business. And so just like you make trade-offs with your money on the journey to financial independence, you do that in your business. And I think people are really increasingly questioning the growth at all costs mindset. I've grown a number of businesses and sold two of them. I've never taken on external investment. I'm very anti, you know, having investors. I like having the freedom and the control. So in the book, I talk a lot about why I do that, how I do that, how I create products, how I sell companies, how I buy companies, what I'm looking for. And really what I think is the future of entrepreneurship is we're all going to end up having our own little holding companies. You know, we build and acquire you know, very cash flow rich businesses and then diversify those into other types of businesses that give our life meaning. And I talk about how I've set up my own holding company and how I'm doing that and how you can work towards doing that as well. And it goes back to it's such a remarkable time to be alive. And, you know, I've read, gosh, well over 400 personal finance books, probably just as many, you know, a couple hundred entrepreneurship books. And one of the things that was missing, I felt like was this end to end understanding of what it means to be an entrepreneur and all the moving pieces involved in it. And so I take people all the way from coming up with an idea to building a holding company and leaving that to your heirs. It's the entire journey. So people just starting out can understand that where this can go and what this could become and how earlier on things like building your company to sell from the beginning, even if you never plan to sell, is a really smart business strategy because all the things that a potential buyer wants are things you should be doing already. And I talk about, you know, how to do that. And yeah, it's a lot of fun. I have a ton of experience and I've invested in a lot of companies and I'm excited to share, you know, what I know you know, with the world and the hopes that I can get people more excited about entrepreneurship and recognize that it can be whatever they want it to be. And there's immense advantages, tax advantages to obviously income advantages to lifestyle advantages that you can take advantage of, you know, being an entrepreneur. Oh my God, I can't wait for this book to come out. Is there a published date yet? Yeah, February, 2025. What is that, like a year and four months away? Traditional publishing takes a long time. You know, if you want updates, you can join on Millennial Money, if you go down to the bottom, there's great corner. It's my email list. You know, I've got, you know, a couple hundred thousand subscribers that I am taking along on this journey with me. And then I actually launched a couple months ago, a membership community called fivepreneurs.com. And there's, you know, over 300 people in this community uh, who are going to get early access to the book. And I'm trying out the ideas with them and sharing, you know, some of the frameworks. And it's been a lot of fun to have a group of people who are beta testing some of these ideas and providing feedback. And it's a lot of fun, like half the people in the community just starting out and half the people are already making 2000 plus on their side businesses. So a really diverse, you know, group of people, that's a lot of fun. So, you know, I've been able to get some of it out a little bit earlier, you know, as I've been creating it. Grant, thank you so much. I'm definitely going to look at all those resources. I really appreciate your time today. I look forward to having you back if you have time for us. And thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your ideas, your really revolutionary lifestyle. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Disha. It's a pleasure to meet you. And thank you for the kind words and the work that you're doing. And I'm you know, happy to come back on in the future. Thank you, Grant, for sharing your insights and expertise with us today. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Finding Financial Freedom with the Frugal Physician. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. Remember, your financial freedom journey starts with the first step. Stay frugal, stay focused, 
and stay tuned for more valuable episodes coming your way. Now, a final word from our sponsor. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand that life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness, injury, or catastrophic event could put you and your family in a devastating financial situation. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Rabbits builds human connections before they create quotes. Visit www.pearsonrabbits.com today and embark on your journey to safeguarding your future. The content shared on this podcast should not be taken as individualized financial advice. We are here to share our knowledge and experiences, but it is crucial to consult with professionals such as accountants, financial advisors, or attorneys who can provide personalized guidance based on your specific needs.